So thank you very much. I'm going to talk about some uh, extensions of some existing models for uh, modeling of reinforced concrete shear walls and then some new tools that we're using to perform this modeling that hopefully will make OpenSeas attractive uh, not only to researchers but also to uh, engineers. So here's the outline of the presentation, basically two blocks. One talks about the models, the other one talks about this tool. Uh, a little bit of the background, uh, basically uh, <coughs> There's two models for shear walls that we implemented in open seas maybe about three or four years ago. One, one is called the multiple vertical line element model. It's a sty standard uh, model for reinforced concrete walls with a fiber section that used to, uh, to describe the flexural behavior, a shear behavior is we described with a shear spring. And these two, uh, shear and flexural, are uncoupled. And this is a fairly standard approach that perform 3D maybe. Uh, if you use it, you're familiar with that. Uh, so it's implemented in open seas. It's a two-node beam column element, and it showed to it showed to work pretty well with the flexure dominant walls, such as RW2, for example, or any other similar walls. Then we ex extended that element to uh, a shear flexure interaction version of this element that implements two-dimensional two-dimensional material uh, model at each fiber level. So it captures the interaction between shear and flexure at the model element level and we validated that one uh, against a lot of tests and it, it works pretty well. Uh, one thing you can notice here is it captures not only nonlinear flexure but also nonlinear shear deformations and they're, cap they're, they're coupled with the flexure deformation. So if you're using one of the linear elastic shear approach you will get something. It's a green line over here but uh, the, the shear flexure model captures the nonlinearity in shear in reinforced concrete walls. And how does that uh, affect on the dynamic behavior. For example, here we're looking at example of a coupled wall uh, system. It's a 15-story building and you can see that if you include shear flexure interaction and nonlinear shear, you can you, you get about 30 percent larger drifts and about 30 percent lower shear demand, which makes a big difference when it comes to design. Uh, and the reason for that is really because you have this hysteretic behavior in shear. You can see the bottom at the bottom over there. So th this is the stuff that we did before, but uh, and they were published quite uh, quite extensively. Uh, we have open seas wiki pages with these old uh, or initial models. They have uh, I just checked the other day that more than fifteen thousand visits since these wiki pages since uh, two thousand and fourteen, which uh, makes me happy. Um, and as a part of this effort, which is published in the peer report in two thousand fifteen we implemented also uh, some material models for concrete and steel as well in addition to these two uh, elements. Uh, now what, what's the, what, what are the shortcomings of these elements? Well first of all they're just the two node elements, they're beam column elements. So if you're trying to model the, the connection with the beams for example and the wall it's very cumbersome and kind, of, uh, kind of annoying to you because you have to add the rigid beams in order to make that connection. It's a very simple uh, trivial problem, but it, it's definitely there. And then, if you wanna, if you if you wanna model uh, non-planar walls, for example, people usually do something like this. They, for example, look at the core wall and they simplify it and end up like a T-section over there. And you can really load that only in two dimensions only. So obviously, there's limitations to these models uh, in terms of how do we extend them and use them for the actual building system. How do we connect beams to it? Uh, and and you cannot really model the three-dimensional behavior with these original models that are currently in open sea. So then what we did, we extended these models to, to overcome these uh, difficulties. And first I'm going to talk about macroscopic models that, that we extended. And it, uh, everything I'm talking about here is conceptually very simple. So we, we started with a two node element. We uh, convert this to a four node element using different uh, interpolation inside of the element. But essentially the element formulation is the same. And then we made it into a 3D. We stick to that. Uh, a linear elastic out of plane behavior because we know that there's some interaction between in and out of plane in, in walls but uh, for now this is for us good enough uh, and then that's our element that's actually 24 degree of freedom element that now is a three-dimensional element we did this for the MVLEM so for the uncoupled version and the, for the shear flexure uh, version and that's something new and it will be available in open seas publicly sometime this year it's the beginning of year so I gave myself enough time uh, to, to implement this publicly. Um, then we validated these models against the planar walls just to make sure they still work okay and then some T-shaped walls uh, and U-shaped walls 
And here, particularly of interest, is the use of, you know, non-planar walls that are subjected to multi-directional loading, because that's what we're trying to, uh, that, that's the, that step that we want to uh, make. So here you see one example of the, really these great tests by Katrin Bayer uh, in Switzerland, where they have this U-shaped walls that is pushed in this spider web configuration. So the, the loading of these walls is quite interesting. And we validated this macro model. So this macro model is, you know, macroscopic. They're pretty computationally efficient, but we are aware of their limitations, but still does pretty good job in terms of the overall load deformation in all directions, maybe except this diagonal direction where we see overestimation about 25, 30%, possibly because of the plane section assumption that, you know, in, in this case, may, might not be that that could, but overall still not, not too bad. It, it performs better than Perform 3D, for example, that we actually validated against the same test that we're overestimating by quite a bit capacity under this multi-directional uh, multi loading. Uh, and then we uh, took one step forward and extended this to the finite element formulation. We use the same two-dimensional material model. We just put it into the uh, relatively standard finite element four node formulation. Uh, and we then validated that against a lot of tests. Um, and here you can see how it performs against maybe eight specimens with the various aspect ratios, axial loads, and shear stresses. It's doing a, a okay job uh, in terms of the strength and stiffness. We looked at some local uh, responses and it's also doing pretty well in terms of, for example, axial growth or cracking patterns or strain profiles along the base. Uh, and then we also moved on to the multi, uh, multi-directional loading of this U-shaped wall and again uh, this finite element formulation now with, which is expected to perform well, it, it did perform uh, well and we validated against several tests of these U-shaped walls that are subjected in different loading uh, patterns and you can see that results are with the finite element pretty good. Even this diagonal loading that was an issue with the macro model now seems to be predicted better with the finite element model, which is expected. Uh, we looked at the strain profiles, for example, on the, uh, in the one of those U-shaped walls, and uh, it's difficult to capture strains accurately in rainforest concrete, especially when it comes to this non-planar walls, multi-directional loading, and sometimes the, even the, the measurements are made at the surface of the wall, and our models are centerline models, so we need to make some maybe progress there, So, but we have to keep that in mind. We're looking at these results. Uh, in my mind, the results are acceptable, but obviously not perfect. Um, so overall, and to sum up this, uh, this part of the presentation, we developed these two macro models that are 3D now. We basically extended the existing models, and then we have this quad wall finite element model. We validated it against of lots of different specimens, unidirectional, multidirectional. And then we're expecting to implement this in open seas. We're working on our wiki pages and examples right now. Uh, so the next thing I want to talk about is a simple tool that we created to simplify our process of, of, uh, of modeling. I, I'm at Cal State Fullerton, so I work mostly with undergraduate students. And I was thinking, how can I you know, make this open seas modeling process more useful, and actually not more useful, more efficient? But then uh, also I was browsing the internet and I saw this slide from 98, uh, probably when Open Seas was starting, when Dr. Dr. Fenves, uh, one of the three goals of Open Seas, and the third goal was to really foster and, uh, and disseminate the new models, the new research into industry. And this is something that I thought maybe there's not a lot of work done. Uh, usually we create our models, we publish papers and we use them, but not a lot of engineers can actually use Open Seas. So uh, there's this huge gap in my the way I see it, between the industry that mostly using ETABs to, to, uh, to simulate buildings, here I'm focusing on buildings more, and academia that uh, uses open seas. And engineers a lot of times say, well, these models are great, but I mean, I'm not gonna, I don't have time to code, and you know, we're like in a fast-paced environment, so how can we bridge this gap? So that, that's kind of the objective here. How can we, you know, uh, get these two worlds closer together? So we developed, we worked over the past couple of years actually uh, on this little tool. It's, it's a kind of a simple tool that's a Python code that takes ETABS model, takes some Excel uh, spreadsheets that are just input for material models and, and uh, analysis input and convert that into OpenSeas, run the OpenSeas for you and 
then you can process results on your own. We can eventually probably develop post-processing tools as well. So this currently, this uh, this tool, uh, you know, you can you can use all these models that you saw earlier, the um, the MVLEM, the shear flexure model for walls, uh, the the finite element model. But we also added the popular beam column elements, the fiber models, the elastic, the shell elements. So we I try to add everything that you would need to model a building. So if you want to model a slab, a wall, a beam, a any of those. Uh, components so that's implemented there you can use pretty much any material in open seas and it's a Python code so we can easily add whatever we need and uh, eventually this can probably become an open source type of thing where people can can, can add whatever they need uh, so one example of application of this will be this four-story a defense test from 2011 um, it's a four-story building it has all the components that uh, we need we have a walls we have frame in one direction we have slab so we created the ETEBS model of that uh, <coughs> of that building uh, we assigned non-linear non fiber based you know uh, columns and beams we use the SFI and VLEM 3D to model the walls and then we use elastic sh slab shell elements for the slab maybe something that engineers uh, would do well, you can go fancier of course but we're trying to keep things kind of uh, practical here uh, so then what you would do you would you know create the loading, the gravity load, the lateral load, uh, whatever static load you, combinations you need. You would assign the mass, uh, whatever you think that the mass is appropriate and important in your modeling. Uh, uh, that's all done in ETABS. And then you would use uh, some uh, pretty friendly looking Excel spreadsheets to define the material properties for steel, concrete, or any other uh, material that, uh, that is available. Uh, and one nice thing about this is I know when I was an engineer it was really kind of frustrating if you have to define 10 different materials you have to click here click there input number click here click there input number so this is uh, I think easier to work with you just define everything in a spreadsheet you have all these materials with tags and then you have to just kind of keep track of all the tags and how to connect them uh, we also have a little macro that we use to define a fiber section so you can visualize the fiber sections over there and you know, it's very simple to, to work with that. So you define an area and location of all the fibers and all the patches and everything. And then we have some input for, for our wall elements. And uh, then we have some analysis input. So if you want to run, for example, if you want to run three ground motions, you define them in a table, the time history, uh, the, the, the names of the files where your time history data is, the data steps and all these basic stuff for the ground motion. And then we also have some drop menus to you know, define uh, what type of analysis you want to run, what's the tolerance, what type of uh, uh, solution strategy you want to use, and stuff like that. So, so the way this works, it's really nothing, nothing fancy. Here is like one example of how this conversion process works. We have ETEBS input files at the beginning, right? That's the red line. We have a folder with our ground motion data, and we have Excel input. We have Open Seas, and we have this converter Python tool. So, what you would do, you would just run. You would start this Python code, and first thing you, you can do, just I need to convert and create an e, uh, OpenSeas model. So it's going to read a bunch of stuff, and you're going to select what materials you want to use. It's going to keep reading. And uh, you can see as Python is doing its own thing, you have all these files showing up. They're all connected to each other. And then you come back. Once you generate the model, it brings you back to the beginning. says, what do you want to do with the model now? Well, now I want to run maybe dynamic analysis. So you click, I think, number six, and then tells you what's your dead load that you want to apply. And then it says, do you want to run multi-thread, in this case, meaning running the three ground motions at the same time. So you, you click on that, and then you have these three ground motion data showing up there. So I think it's pretty practical and, and kind of a simple thing. It just simplifies simplifies open Z's modeling in a way and now you know this is really what something one can do maybe in, in the design office so uh, post-processing results is kind of still on your own you have to like come up with some MATLAB codes or something like that but uh, it's as long as you understand how the rows and columns are organized that's not 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 that difficult a and in summary that's pretty much it right so we have this tool that uh, first of all I think it's very simple uh, includes all building components that we, one might need to model the building and uh, it uses all the software that it's already available 
in a design office such as eTubs, Excel, and Python, which is free, right? Uh, but now this makes all these state-of-the-art models for walls or beams or materials, whatever it is, available to engineers. And it, this conversion process is, as you saw, pretty quick and straightforward. So at this point, I'd, you know, I'd like to invite if there's any people from industry here that are interested to try to play with this, we can talk and you know work together to let's try to model some real buildings. Uh, we're tired of these archetypes, they're all perfect and square, right? So, w with open seats. Um, <clears throat> what else is going on? This is really all part of a, uh, an SF project that is uh, looking into tall buildings and resilient base design. So we're using these models to analyze tall buildings, calculate their downtime losses, and try to improve uh, the resiliency of tall buildings in urban areas. And this is collaboration with Vesna Terzic from Cal State Long Beach. And then uh, we also want to use these models to perform a system level validation. We all know that these models are pretty good in a component level, but let's put them all in the system and see what the challenges are. So here, we just came back from Japan where we saw this uh, really impressive test of a 10-story rainforest concrete building. Uh, so there was a similar test in 2015 and we're hoping to get a data soon so we can play with these models. And uh, there's another test coming up in, in, in June in Macedonia in Isis, uh, about a three-story coupled wall. So we're gathering and, and working internationally to get all these system level tests and then use our models to calibrate them uh, on the system level and see what can we learn from, from that. And at the end, I would just wanna thank to all my students, to Carlos, Ben, Nathan, Kamiar, and Ross, and uh, my valuable uh, academic colleagues, John Wallace, Kutai Rakchow, and Vesna Thank you.